Hi, I'm Tony. Welcome to South Peoria Baptist Church. We're really glad you took the time to join us today as we continue to study and grow in God's Word. Woo! Yeah! All right. Now let's take a look to see what's going on around campus this week. If this is your first time visiting with us, welcome. We encourage you to fill out the connection card in our bulletin and drop it in the offering plate later in our service. We encourage everyone, visitors and members alike, to connect with us via our website, our connection card, or through our giving kiosk located right here in the lobby. Good morning, my name is Michelle Puente, and I'm blessed to work with the children here at South Peoria. On Sunday mornings, children are exploring the Bible using music, videos, and hands-on activities. On Wednesday evenings, children are participating in The Greatest Journey, where they have learned about God's greatest gift, sharing God's gift, and walking with God. The children are looking forward to November, when they will get to share with you what they have been learning, and when we will be having a shoebox packing party. Once again, we're grateful you were able to join us today. If you have any questions, please feel free to stop by our office during our office hours or visit us at our website or Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for coming. Have a great day. God, I've been comfortable for way too long. Please forgive me. I know you want to use me to show your love in this world. Give me eyes to see needs of others and a heart that dares to get involved where you are working. God, my life is yours. Whatever you want, wherever you lead, here I am, Lord. Send me. All right, God is good. That's right, and all the time. God is good. Amen. I am excited for this weekend. I'm excited about today. And we've been going through a series called Dangerous Prayers. Before we continue that today, I just want to draw your attention. You should have received, when you walked in this morning, one of our handouts, one of our bulletins like this. If you're a guest with us today, this is our bulletin. There's a couple of things I just want to point out. If you open this up right away, you'll see a communication card. And this is for us to be able to uh, connect with you on a better level. And so we ask if you're a guest with us today, if it's your first time, fifth time, 20th time, but you haven't connected with us yet, Please fill that out and drop it in the offering plate later on in our service. And then if you actually flip that over on the back side of this, this is actually our prayer card. Our staff meets every day to pray through the needs of our church. And so please, if you have a prayer need in your life, write that down because our church prays and our, our staff prays for what's going on. In fact, we're doing a series on prayer right now. We feel that we know that prayer is important and foundational to our faith. Amen? So one of the reasons I'm really excited about this weekend is um, it's our fall festival weekend. And it's one of the biggest events that we do at South Peoria. It's always been a part of our DNA and part of our culture. And uh, last year we ramped it up, and this year it's going to be great just like last year was. And so, but we, we understand that as we're, the reason we're doing this prayer series is to lead up. Tomorrow is going to be the fall festival, but the foundation is set with prayer. And tonight we're actually having our prayer rally at 6 o'clock for our whole church to come together where we can assign roles and volunteer for different positions of what's going to be happening tomorrow. But the important thing is going to happen tonight with prayer. And so we want all of our church to show up tonight. We'll be in the first building up there at 6 o'clock as we just bathe tomorrow in prayer. We're expecting over 2,000 people on our campus tomorrow night. And this room right here is actually instrumental. This room becomes the focus for us as a church as all the games and, and craziness and food and fun's happening on the outside. In this room is what's called the Walk of Hope. And we, we get everybody who comes onto our campus to come through the Walk of Hope, and it gives them hope to understand the gospel in a different way. Maybe they've never heard the gospel before, but we present it tomorrow in a creative way. And so back here in the back, you'll see there's actually one of our stations in progress in the back over there, and it's a, progress, it's a station that talks about people in the Bible where their identity was their sin, like Noah was a drunk, Samson left his wife, Elijah was suicidal, Joseph was abused by his families, and all these identities that they could be wrapped up in, and then when you lift it up, it actually shows how God transformed them and used them even though they had these things going on in their life that we would identify with today. This is the place that it happens. And so we want everybody, every part of our church, you are important because your voice is a prayer and it's powerful. In fact, the, the t-shirt that I'm wearing today, this is our fall festival t-shirt. 
And um, I don't typically preach in a t-shirt if you're a guest with us today. But uh, these tonight, we're asking our whole church family to buy these. They're $8 tonight and to wear them tomorrow night so that our community can identify you. If they have a question, if they have a prayer need, they can ask you because you're wearing one of these shirts. So these will be available tonight as well. And so this weekend is very instrumental. And it's going to be the foundation of prayer. We understand that. And that tomorrow we're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel in many ways that are very creative. And, but that starts with prayer. And that's why we've been going through the series that leads up to tonight. And so I'm excited. If you remember the first week, we talked about a very dangerous prayer. And, we, and I just want to preface this for you. If you're a Christian, you don't have to pray these prayers. They, your, your salvation doesn't hinge on these prayers. Salvation comes from believing in your heart and confessing in your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what salvation is. But if you want to grow in an intimate way with God beyond anything you've ever done before and you start praying these prayers, you're going to see something happen in your life. And that's why they're called dangerous because they'll grow you and God will move you in a way he's never worked in your life before when you pray these prayers. In fact, the first week, we prayed a prayer right out of, out of Psalm 139. It was, it was David's prayer. And he says, search me, God, and know my heart. God already knows your heart and knows my heart. But the reason we ask him to search us is to reveal to us the hidden motives, the things in our heart that are not aligned with God. Search me, God, and reveal my heart. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, show me what I fear the most because where I fear the most is where I trust you the least. What I fear the most is where I need to trust you more. So search me, God. Know my heart. Show me any anxious thoughts that I have. See if there is any offensive way in me. Is there anything in my life that is offensive to God? Is there anything happening in my life that does not align with his word? Is there something that needs to change that I'm not willing to address? And so those first three parts of that prayer were all about God. You need to please examine me. And then the last part, the fourth part is powerful. God, lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in your way everlasting, right? That was the first week. Last week, we prayed a prayer called break me. God, please Break me. Break me of myself. Break me of the things that keep me from growing deep with you. And we talked about the woman, the woman who had a promiscuous past who came to the feet of Jesus right before he was crucified and broke a jar, an expensive jar full of perfume that was worth a year's worth of wages at his feet, broke it, and then poured it all over him. And she broke and poured out her life into Jesus. And then in that same chapter of Mark, Jesus stood up at the last supper, that we called the Last Supper. He stood up at the table with the disciples and picked up a piece of bread and broke it and said, this is my body that is broken for you. And then he picked up a cup of wine and said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. So she was broken and poured out. And then Jesus was broken and poured out for each of us, showing us that we need to live broken and poured out. So if we pray for God to break us, he will remove the things in our life that keep us from being intimate with him. It was a pretty intense Sunday. And this Sunday is my favorite of the three. This Sunday is God, send me. Send me. These aren't prayers that are easy prayers. These aren't your, your typical prayers. These aren't benign prayers. These aren't God, thank you for this day. Bless this food, amen. This isn't God, help me have a great day today. These are prayers that could shake us to the foundation of our core as Christians in order to grow us closer to Christ. So as we look at today's, today's prayer, send me, I, it was interesting. We're going to be coming out of Isaiah chapter 6, and it's interesting. A while ago, I talked about the prayer cards, and we encourage you, please pray, fill those prayer cards out. Prayer is powerful, and place that in the offering plate later in our service so we can pray for you. And we understand the power of prayer. But one thing I've come to see and understand is often, and it's not a bad thing, so please don't take what I'm about to say is a bad thing. It's a good thing. One of the things we do most often when we pray is we pray about the things that affect our lives the most, right? Pray, God, please help me with what's going on at work. God, please help with my, with my grandmother who, who is sick. God, please help me get through this stressful situation. Please make my relationship with my wife better. We start praying these prayers that affect us the most, and we need to pray those prayers because God is the provider and the one who steps in and heals relationships, heals bodies. We need to pray those prayers. God wants us to depend on him. But what I'm going to suggest today is a challenge that takes us one step farther in our prayer life. This, not just God, this is what I need you to do for me. We need to pray those prayers, and we're going to continue to pray those prayers. But then we take another step of faith, and we ask, God, what do you need me to do for you? God, send me. This is going to be a challenge. This is going to be a challenge for us. And so this is ultimately a prayer of availability. We're going to look at Isaiah here, chapter 6. And this is a prayer of availability going, God, my life is yours. Interrupt it, step in, whatever you want, whenever you want. I'll sign a blank contract. God, I will follow you. 
this is what I want to do, God, is to give you everything because you've given me everything. And so this is what we're going to look like. So if you'll stand with me, we're going to turn to Isaiah. It's in the Old Testament. He was a prophet of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. And to be honest with you, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's a beautiful passage. The imagery is beautiful. And this is Isaiah. And this is, oh, I, I get excited about this. I had to write in seminary a 15-page paper about the Hebrew, uh, the actual Hebrew uh, scriptures in this and what it actually says. And it's so much Im imagery in here, but this is beautiful. So let's read it together. Chapter 6, verse 1, Isaiah, this is actually Isaiah writing. It's his commission. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your guilt is taken away. Think about that. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you right now, and we, we, we know your presence is in this place. So we lift this time up to you. We've looked at your word, God, and we ask that you take your word, you use it as a mirror to examine our hearts, to show us where we do have offenses ways, to show us, God, where we fear the most so we can trust you more. So God, use your word today to reveal us to become more like you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. So as we talk about this, this prayer of availability, if we are going to pray this prayer, send me. Here's the truth. If we truly send this, pray this prayer, send me, guess what God's gonna do? He's going to move you. He may move you to a different city. He may move you to a different job. He may move you, he may move, he may, he may move you out of the person, relationship with the person you're dating right now because you're not supposed to be dating them. And he's going to upgrade in your life, right? He's got somebody better. That's awkward for some of you because you're sitting right next to the person you need to be upgraded from. And so that's the truth, right? You may be in a relationship dating somebody you have no business with. And God's saying, you need to move. If you're going to pray, send me, get out of this and move to where you need to be. Okay? So when we pray this prayer, God's going to move in our lives. He's going to move in our lives. And so through Scripture, the Old Testament, which we're in today in Isaiah, and through the New Testament, there's something that's very apparent in every single life of every follower of God, of every follower of Jesus, and every follower in the Bible, and every follower in this room. And that's that God calls us. God calls us. The phone's not going to ring in the middle of church, and you're not going to answer it and say, hey, God, you're not going to get a text message right? That would be pretty cool though, wouldn't it? You're not going to get a text message, but God is going to speak into your life. He's going to speak in different ways. He may put a life call onto your life. He may call you into ministry, say it's, it's time for you to move into ministry. Your life's going to be spent in full-time ministry as a pastor, as a missionary, as a teacher. He may actually call in a moment and say, right now I want you to say this. I want you to stop here and do this. I want you to act. He may actually call you to speak. So when we give God free reign of our life, he will call us for a lifetime, and he will call us for moments. He will call you and use you to accomplish his purpose, right? And so that's what God will do. He calls us, every single one of us, as followers of Christ. And there's three ways that we actually respond to this call. Three ways we respond. So here's the truth. For us to really get to the send me prayer, there's a process. This isn't something we can come to just kind of half-heartedly. It's not something we can just say as a magical prayer. This is something we have to come to genuinely. So I want to first examine three ways we respond to the call and then three things we can do to move genuinely to this prayer. The first thing, first way we respond is the way Jonah responded. The first is Jonah's response. And this is what Jonah said. Here am I, Lord. I won't go. Right? And let's, let's raise our hand if we, can, if we can say, hey, that's kind of my life sometimes, right? Uh, some of you guys are lying. All right? 
let's be honest. Jonah said, here I am, God, I won't go. In fact, let's look at Jonah's story. This is out of Jonah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. This is what happened. God spoke to Jonah and said this, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So Jonah, go. All right, God. And then Jonah said, but Jonah, he didn't say anything. He just ran. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. How did that end up? He got eaten, right? We understand what happens here. And then he got thrown up. I don't know which was worse. But the truth is, Jonah, didn't, he just ran. He said, here I am, God, no, I'm, I ain't going, right? And the truth is, we all fall into this at times in our life. As we say, here I am, God, I'm not going. We may see a situation, God, I want you to talk to them. Oh, okay, I'm going to do it. I, can, I know God wants me, not today, right? Yep, or we, come, we see somebody on the side of the road that needs a tire change. Maybe, maybe it's, it's an older lady, and you realize, you know, you've still got that desire. I've talked about this. You, in your heart, you're, you work in the pit crew in NASCAR, and you know you can change that tire in 60 seconds, and it's going to take her three hours waiting for AAA to show up. And you're like, I know I should stop. God's telling me to stop. I, I just got too much on my plate today, and we keep on going, right? We know what it's like to be like Jonah. It'd be foolish for us to think Jonah was the only one that lived this way. The truth is, Jonah said, here was the response. God put a calling on his life, and Jonah said, here I am. I ain't going. I'm running away. The second one I want to look at is Moses. Moses, and this is what Moses said. Moses said, here I am, Lord, send someone else, right? And a lot of us identify with this. In fact, this is, this is powerful. God showed up physically in Moses' life as a burning bush. Moses is standing right there, and he's talking to God, and God says, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. You're in the presence of God. And God says, this is what he says. He says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now listen. Listen. Moses agrees with this, and he knows it needs to happen. He is an Israelite who was part of the Israelites who are enslaved. In fact, the reason the Bible says he was on the back side of the desert, he was out in the middle of nowhere because he stood up for the Israelites and killed, a, killed an Egyptian, and he ran away fearful for his own life. He knew the Egyptians were enslaved and being tortured as people and being abused as people. So God showed up and said, Moses, I'm going to send you to get the Israelites out of slavery. And Moses, that's a good idea, God. Send someone else. Send someone else. This is what he said. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This is what it sounds like in our world today. God, somebody else has to give. Somebody who has more money I need needs to give. God, somebody who has more time than I do needs to take care of that. God, I don't have the time. I don't I don't have the money. I don't I don't have the ability to do that. God, somebody who speaks better than I do needs to be the person that talks to them. That was Moses' excuse, right? I don't speak well. I don't speak well. That's, 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 a guilt, that's, a, that's a thing in my life as well. I consider myself a pretty smart person. And I'm really good at math and science. One of the things I'm horrible at is the English language, even though I speak it, right? And grow, in the last few years of preaching, in the past, since my students would make fun of me because even preaching in church, I have to make up words that aren't real words trying to get my, get my point across, and people laugh because they're like, that's not a real word. In fact, one of my students who's here today in the past would actually make fun of me. Every time I'd preach, I would use one of my favorite words, and my favorite word was funner. And most people realize in here, if you're, if you're bad as me as English, you don't get this. But if you are good at English, you realize funner is not a word. I don't know why it's not a word, because that expresses very clearly that this is funner than that is, right? <laughs> but he would stop me every time I was preaching, Jeremiah, that's not a word. Now, I'm not good at the English language. God, send somebody else who can communicate. You're talking to the king. Send somebody who is well-spoken, somebody who has a good command of the English language. And God says, no, 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 I'm sending you, Moses. Moses said, here I am, send someone else. And here's, here's a freebie right here. This isn't in the notes, but if you're taking notes on the back of the bulletin or following along on the Bible app in the notes, write this down. God doesn't, God doesn't call those who are equipped. He equips those who he calls. And he uses their weaknesses to show his glory. And so God calls Moses, and Moses is like, I'm not the guy. This isn't my strength. Send someone else. And if we're, we can all raise our hand and say we're guilty of that, right? That is, that is true. That is one of the ways to respond. So Jonah said, here I am. I'm not going. Moses said, here I am. Send someone else. And now we get to Isaiah. And this is what Isaiah says. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. And this is different. This is, listen to what God said well, this is actually Isaiah. Isaiah is recording this firsthand account. He says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who is willing to go for us? Who will go for us? And before I get to here I am, send me, I want to address what Isaiah didn't say. 
okay? I want to address that he didn't say, okay, God, where are we going? Like, where do you want to send me? Okay, God, uh, what's the pay package like? What's the weather going to be? Are there benefits? Right? That's, that's, he didn't ask the questions. And I, I get this on God's side, because if I was God, I'd be frustrated with Jonah and Moses. Uh, in my home, I, I, I love my house on Fridays. Uh, my kids don't have school on Fridays. They go to school Monday through Thursday. And so Fridays is a special time in our house. I get to, it's the day I try to take off, and so I sleep in a little bit, and then I get up, and then Fridays are known as adventure days with Daddy, okay? And so this is what happens when Daddy gets up, he walks into the living room and tells the kids, all right, guys, get ready to go, right? It's, it's time, they, it's, Fridays are adventure days. We do all kinds of crazy stuff on Fridays, whether it's like, we, we try to make adventures happen, right? And so one of the things that, that dr- drives me nuts as a dad is when I walk into the living room on Friday mornings and I say, all right, guys, everybody get ready to go. And then I hear, where are we going? Why? Are we going to eat first? Like all these questions start coming, right? And I'm like, you guys, every Friday is adventure day and it's a blast. Just get ready to go, right? And God's saying, hey, get ready to go. And Isaiah says, all right, no questions. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. But I'm going to be honest with you. There has to be a process. This, uh, for us to truly get to this point, this is a place of complete surrender. This is not something we can do half-heartedly. It's not something we just show up to and say, all right, God, send me. This is something we have to go through a process to get to so that we're ready to pray this prayer of complete surrender. I mean, we're talking about signing a completely blank contract saying, God, use me. I'll go when and where, whatever you want to do. About 12 years ago, I was on staff at a church, and I was on the missions committee, staff member responsible for the missions committee, and the chair of the missions uh, committee is somebody I, hold, I held in a very high respect. Her name is Faith. And we're sitting in the middle of a missions committee talking about what the church is going to be doing for missions that summer. And she stops the meeting and looks at me and she goes, Jeremiah, do you have a passport? This is about 12 years ago. I go, no. Why not? Never needed one before. And she, I'm telling you, right now, it's pastoral staff on a church. She stops right there and puts me on the spot and says, you're not ready when God calls you. If God were to say, tomorrow you're going to China, you can't go. And I'm like, top of the to-do list, get a passport. <laughs> right? Because there was truth spoken there, wasn't there? There was something in my life that was going to complete. If God was going to show up and say, God, Jeremiah, you need to go, I wouldn't be able to. Yeah. And she, that was to-do list. Took me two more years. I'm not going to say I'm perfect. Took me two more years to get a passport. But I got it done. And since then, I've traveled the world a little bit in missions, I've been in other countries. It's been very awesome to experience, right? Something we hold dear at South Peoria. And the truth is, it, that applies to our life. If you don't have a passport and God were to show up tomorrow, you guys are shaking right now, I can feel it. If God were to show up and say, you're going to Africa, uh-uh. That's why I don't have a passport, so I can't go. <laughs> right? This is a prayer of total surrender, a blank contract. Blank contract for us to understand this. All right. So three things. Those are the three responses to God's call. Now, I want to talk about the three things I believe we need to experience. What do you need to fully experience? What do you need to fully, what do you need to do to fully surrender to God for you to really pray that prayer? God, send me. And I believe number one is this. We need a genuine experience with the presence of God. We need a genuine experience. I'm not talking about a quiet time. I'm not talking about a prayer. I'm talking about walking like walking into the presence of God. And that just, this happened in Isaiah's life. Look at this. This is what happens. In the year that King Uzziah died, let's read the next four words together. I saw the Lord. Let's read it again. I saw the Lord. What's the most important thing in this paragraph? Isaiah saw the Lord. And all of a sudden, he walks into the presence of God. And I saw the Lord, and he was high and exalted, lifted up. And the train, the, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And then there was these angels called seraphim, and they were covering their eyes and their feet, and they were flying with the other two wings, and they're flying all around God. And I walked into the presence of the Almighty, and it changed me forever. And they flew around, and they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it changed my life. The truth is, every single one of us, if we walk, I'm not talking about just a simple prayer or a simple quiet time. I'm talking about spending time in the presence of God. It changes you. It changes you. When I was 19 years old, I was engaged to be married. And uh, I, was, I was working and serving at a, I wasn't in, 
on staff at a church at this point, but I was working at, serving at a church, teaching junior high and working with teenagers. And I was 19. I was loving life and loving the world, engaged to the most beautiful woman in the world. And life was good, right? And I was just enjoying life. Well, when I was a small child, starting at as a small age, people spoke something over me. And that was like, you're going to be a pastor like your dad when you grow up. You're gonna, and at first, as a child, I really liked that. But as I became rebellious in my heart as a teenager, I started to resent that. I didn't want anything to do with being a pastor as a teenager. I saw the hard life of Pastor Lee's. I saw the hours that were put in. I saw the pay that wasn't enough. I saw all the things that happened as a, pattern, as, as a pastor, and my heart became cold against that. But people had spoken that over me. It was a calling on my life. At this point at 19, I was loving life, you know? I got dreams. I got paychecks. I've got things that are happening. I'm, I'm getting married. And on the way to work every day, I drive through a bad neighborhood, and I pass this building. It was a, it was, I think it was on Indian School, and it was an, a, a, a nightclub building. And outside this nightclub, they had like a beach set up for like beach volleyball. It was really cool, and it just seemed like a nightclub after nightclub after nightclub failed there. It just like kept failing and failing and failing and failing, and, and nothing could make it there, but it was a cool building. Drove by it, and for about one night, I'm driving by, and God says, hey, do you see that? I'm like, yeah, I saw that. And so for about a week, every night as I drove by that, he says, you see that? And after about a week, God says, pull in. So I pulled into this parking lot, pulled into this parking lot. 19 years old, I've got the world by a string, right? Good job, great wife, or engaged to a great wife. Things are going to happen. I'm doing what I think I'm supposed to be doing by serving God and working with, with, with youth at a church, volunteering. And so I'm sitting there in this parking lot. I'm like, I don't know why I'm here. I'm just sitting in an abandoned parking lot in a bad neighborhood. And I get out and bored. I walk around the building. I know I'm there for a reason. God said, pull in here. And this isn't a normal thing in my life. And so I walk around this building. And after about an hour of just sitting there, I realize, I, say, I start talking to God. I said, God, you could use this building. Like, do you realize what would happen if this wasn't a nightclub? Like, if it wasn't used for sin, but if it was actually used for your glory? Like, if you, if you took this building and turned it into a community center, a Christian community center to reach kids for Christ... And there's volleyball and sports. And I started telling God all these things that he could do with this building, right? And I was there for a couple hours at this point. And, and, and I'm like, God, if you would just show up, you could, you could do this and explain this. It's trying to tell God what he should do, right? In the presence of God. And in that moment, just like that, God says, this building is you. This is your life. And it belongs to me. You are now starting to see things the way that I see them. And it's not, you're not here for this building you're here to realize this building represents you. And it was in that moment and that night that I realized my call to be a pastor. In the presence of God, it was not something I expected to do, but in those hours, I realized I'm in the presence of God and he changed my life like that. No longer rebellious, ready to do what God ever did. I walked into his presence and it showed me life change and realized I need to depend on God, especially because now it's dark outside, and I'm in a really bad neighborhood at, a, at an abandoned, abandoned uh, nightclub. There's no telling what could happen, right? Depend on God. That was a joke. It fell flat. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> depend, when you walk into the presence of God, you can't be the same afterwards. Yeah. And the truth is, is some of us are struggling with this idea of God send me, this blank contract prayer of God send me. It's because we have not experienced the presence of God lately in our lives. Because when we walk into the presence of God, we are different. Just like Isaiah, he experienced something different. But then, not only did he have a genuine ex uh, experience in the presence of God, something else happened. These angels started singing, and all of a sudden, the temple started shaking. The foundation started rocking, and the whole temple filled with smoke. You see, when you first walk into the presence of God, you are in awe. Like, oh my goodness, God is so great. And then Isaiah's awe turned to fear when he realized, I'm in the presence of God. And it snapped him out of the awe, and this is his response. You see, this is what needs to happen after a genuine experience of God's presence, is we need to have a genuine awareness, a genuine awareness of our own sinfulness. A genuine awareness of our own sinfulness. Because here's what happens. Here's the lie. Here's the lie that we believe. A cultural lie is that everybody has a good heart. We're all good in nature. And Jeremiah, we talked about this last week, Jeremiah shows us the heart is evil, it's deceitful, it's a liar, it's more evil than anything else. In fact, nobody knows how, much, how truly evil our hearts are. The only thing that makes our hearts good is the fact that Jesus redeems them. 
And so we are not good people. We are evil people. We are wicked people because we are broken people. And Jesus steps in, redeems our hearts, and creates a new creation. And what, this is how Isaiah, when he stepped into the presence of God and realized after the awe, and when he was shook, this is what he said. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I am among people among, of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah identified his sin as to do with his lips, the words he had spoken revealing his heart, and the people who had worshipped other idols and confessing things to other idols, their mouths had bowed before other gods. So his identity of his sin was found in his lips, and when you walk into the presence of God, how good God is shows how good we are not. And the response to God's glory when we're in his presence, not only does it change us forever, but it drops us to our knees to go, I am done. I'm I'm destroyed. I don't even, the glory of God is going to destroy me because of the sin in my life. The sin in my life is not worthy of the presence of God. And then something happened. You see, we see he walked into the presence of God. It changed him. He recognized and had a true understanding of his own sinfulness. But the third thing, actually I want to read this. The third thing is a genuine understanding of God's grace. A genuine understanding of God's grace. Listen, then one of the seraphim, the angels, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Listen to this part. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. He understood God's full grace. See, when you walk into the presence of God, you are in awe and it changes you. Then you realize how sinful and how good you are not and it brings you to your knees realizing you can't be in the presence of God. And then God pours his grace out. Today it's the same for you and for me. The blood of Jesus on the cross covered every sin of our lips. Think about this. Your lies, your cheating, your deceitfulness, your lust, the secret sins that live in each and every single one of us in the presence of God gets covered with grace. And we are forgiven and atoned for. This is how Jeremiah, this is how Isaiah said this. This is why Isaiah said this. Do you get this? When we come into the presence, we realize how simple we are, then we realize how graceful and how much we fall into the grace of God. The only, the only logical response is, I'll go. When we understand, who shall I send? Who will go for us? God, it's me. It's me. I'll go, God. It's me. I understand. I understand what it is to live in your grace. And here's the thing. We need to understand this. When we fully understand God's grace, this is a blessing. This isn't, man, I got to get up and go to church today. I got to work in the two-year-old's room. I got to, man, I got to do this because Jesus died for me, right? If that is our attitude, we don't understand grace. Because when we understand grace, It's completely different. It's, I get to serve Jesus. When I understand the grace that's been poured out on me, I get to serve my king. And it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'll sign that blank contract, and I will go. I will go, God. Whatever you want me to do, I will go. It is not a chore to serve God when you understand grace. And so, as we think about this, we sense God's presence, we embrace our sinfulness, we fall on his grace. It's not something we have to do, it's something we get to do, and it's not a one-time choice. It's not like on December 18th of 2002, I said, God, send me. Right? I got it. That's when I understood grace. This, one. this is a daily thing. This is us going before ourselves every day and saying, I'm choosing to die to myself. I'm choosing to die to myself. Today, I'm going to serve Christ. Today, I'm going to live for him to say yes to Jesus. Because when we become a Christian, when we do, when you become a follower of Christ, what happens is he steps into your life and he brings the old dead self to life. There's a new creation. The Bible says there's a new creation. And so now you have two parts. When Jesus creates a new creation in you, there's two parts. The Bible calls one part the flesh. It's not literally your skin, but it's the side of you that still wants to be wicked. 
the fleshly desires, the part where lust dwells, the part where hate dwells, the part where, where lying dwells is called the flesh. And the new side, the new creation, the eternal creation is the spirit side that God has brought you to life to live eternally with him. But those still exist together. And so while we're together in the flesh and in the spirit, that flesh tries to, tries to take over and it tries to lead us. Well, God's saying, no, no, you need to die to self. You need to die to flesh. So that's why Paul says, I, I, I die to self every day. To live is Christ, right? Christ lives in me. It is Christ in me, not me living. So how? How do we, how do we put the old person to death and let the new creation live on? It's very simple. I, and I love this part because it gets to math. Are you guys ready? You can write this down. This is pretty deep. What you feed grows. What you starve dies. What you feed grows, what you starve dies. Think about this. If you feed the spiritual side of your life, you're in the word, you're spending time with other believers, you're going to church, you're serving, you're doing the things of God, you are feeding your spiritual self. And guess what's going to grow? Your spiritual self is going to become more conformed to God, right? Spiritual self. So if you live your life going, not today, God, I want to do this in my life today, God. God, it's all about me. I don't have time for that. I, I, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I I'm going to heaven when I die. But today I'm going to do me, 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 me. You're starving your spiritual side and feeding your flesh. And your life's going to be all about you. See, this is why this is not just a simple prayer for us to pray. It's a dangerous prayer. We have to go in understanding. But if we feed that spiritual side, we become stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger while that flesh becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And so as we pray this prayer, there's, there's a question that I ask. Why don't we pray this prayer more often? Why haven't we as a church prayed this prayer? As I grew up, in the church I grew up in, it was interesting. It was a traditional Southern Baptist building. It was, it was uh, pews, and they had one aisle down the middle and pews on each side, and the walls in the front were panel. I remember it was wood panel. And on the walls were actually wood, wood letters, and it had this verse, Here am I, send me, at the front of the church. I saw it every Sunday and Wednesday night. Here am I, send me. And even when it was in front of us, how come we didn't pray this more? And I believe there's one of two answers. Number one, maybe we haven't thought about it. That's taking the easy way out. But number two, here's what I'm thinking. Number two, here I am, send me. I think the reason we don't pray this prayer is because we're fearful of what the answer is going to be when we say, God, send me. And I'm going to be honest with you, okay? Just like I said earlier, I don't have a passport just in case God says go to Africa, right? The truth is many of us have a fear that if we sign this contract, God send me, we may end up in India or Indonesia or somewhere with pygmies or people who eat heads. I don't know. Somewhere where you'll never, ever use a toilet again, right? That's our fear is that God might actually do that. And here's the truth. Are you ready? That might happen. God might move you and say, go to Africa. He might move you and say, go to India. That might happen, but the honest truth is that's usually few and far between, right? He doesn't call most people to Africa, otherwise we'd all be in Africa. God calls most of us to where we already are, to the people across the street, to the people in your workplace. And when you call, when we say, God, whenever, whatever, however, I'll do what you want, you may find yourself with a call in your life to be bolder than you've ever been bold before, but bolder than you ever have at work, saying things that you would never have said before because you were in fear of speaking out, talking to your neighbors like you never have before, maybe actually learning their names because most of us don't know the names of our neighbors, actually living when God, when we say, God, send me, the truth is he's already placed most of us where he wants us. We're just not living a sent life. And so the truth is, if we actually get beyond that, then we understand what it is to live and to feed the Spirit. It's for us to be obedient. Okay, God, today my hands are yours. Today my feet are yours. My lips are yours. My eyes are yours. My mouth is yours. God, whatever you want for me today, I'll be your hands, your feet, your mouth. Whatever you want today, I'll be that person, God, every single day. This is not just a one-time thing, but a daily prayer. And guess what may happen? You may end up reaching your neighbors. You may end up being bold at work. You may be working in a two-year-old classroom over here, which is like going to Africa because they don't use toilets either. This is what may happen in your life is that you may live fulfilled knowing that you are in a deeper relationship with God because here's what happens. Most of us, we think of a calling on our life as something huge and big. I'm going to Africa. I'm building, I'm building a, uh, uh, a well. I'm doing, we're doing all these things. And yes, that happens. 
But most of the time, God calls us to be obedient on a daily basis. And it's the little things. Helping out a single mom, buying them lunch, which may mean nothing to us, but means the world to them. Spending time and, and, and babysitting foster kids so that a family can get some respite care. Doing these things that we don't even think are big things, but we know they're obedient things. And here's what happens. As we become more and more obedient to these things, guess what they do? It's just like a bank account. They add up to bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger things because to who God has given, much is required. And to who has been responsible with much, he will give more. And so we begin to say every day, wow, do you see what God did in my life? Do you see what God did in their life? And all of a sudden, we're living in a sent life, seeing God at work all around us. If we are living in a place in life right now where we don't see God at work, it's not because God's not working. It's because we're not paying attention and we may be feeding the flesh instead of the spirit. And so today, as we wrap this up, this idea of prayer, the challenge as we've gone through this is an anchor. We've talked about an anchor message. Today, if this grabs a hold of your heart, this may be an anchor for the rest of your life. An anchor message is a message that you remember from 15, 20, 10 years ago that you remember before you heard that message, you were different. And God spoke to you through that message, and the rest of your life changed. It was on a different trajectory. So these prayers that we've been talking about may be one of those anchors for you moving forward. The very simple today, God, here I am. I understand what it is to be in the presence of God. I understand the extent of my sinfulness, but I understand the completion of your grace. And so God, today, the answer is send me. I'll send you. I want to finish with this story. In a church kind of like ours, a little bit smaller, they, they do this, a lot of things similar to we do, and it's, one of our traditions is as you leave, our pastors stand in, in the, the lobby and shake hands and tell you, you know, we love you, thank you for coming today. It's a great experience for us to get to see you and talk a little bit, but a lot of the times people are rushed to get out, and it's hard to have really deep conversations in the lobby. And so in this little church, it was the same way, and uh, this guy shows up to church, and the pastor's standing in the back after the sermon, everybody's coming through, a great, pass, great message today, pastor, yes, yes, and this guy comes up, he goes, pastor, you don't even understand the blessing of your message today, the answer is yes. What's the question? And the pastor says, all right, have a great day. <laughs> Just moved him right on out the door because there's other people's hands to shake, right? Week number two, this guy shows up. And he's, like, he's emotional this time. Pastor, the message is right to my heart today. The answer is yes. What's the question? And the pastor's like, okay, that's a little weird. I'm just, you know, that's a great question, brother. We'll see you next week. It moves him right out the door. Third week comes along. And the guy shows back up. And he's like, he's even more emotional. He's like, pastor, what's the question? The answer is yes. And the pastor's like, you know what? We need to have coffee because I have no clue what you're talking about. So that week, he, they met for coffee, and the pastor sits down. The very first thing he asked me, goes, hey, I don't get what you're saying. You said the answer is yes. What's the question? And the guy sits there with the pastor says, you don't get it. Pastor, four weeks ago, when you shared the gospel, it was the first time I experienced the presence of Christ. Like, my life opened up, and I saw it, and I realized my life. I realized my sin. I asked him for forgiveness, and he has changed me. He goes, you don't understand my life. I was an addict and God saved me. You go ask my wife. I took advantage of my wife and my children and I, I abused them. It was bad, God. But if you go and ask them today, my wife will tell you I'm different. My children will tell you different. Go to my work. My boss will tell you I'm different. Because four weeks ago, I met Jesus. Four weeks ago, I met Jesus. And today, I am different. And because today I am different, the answer is yes. So what I need to know from you, Pastor, is what's the question? 2 a.m., you need the lawn mode? I'm there. You need me to go visit somebody in the hospital? I'm there. You need me to pray? I'm there. God changed me. So the answer is yes, I'll do it. So for us today, for us to truly get to the point where the answer is yes, for that prayer to be deep in our lives, to be real in our lives, here I am, send me. The truth is we need to experience the presence of God in our lives. We need to come to a, a genuine understanding of the sinfulness in our life. And then we need to fall full head on into the beautiful of God's grace, the beauty of God's grace. And then the only answer is, yes, I'll go. Father God, we come to you this morning and we give this time to you. We know your presence is here. So God, we pray as we come into your presence here, God, that you examine our hearts. We've looked at your word. We've heard, here I am, I won't go. Here I am, send someone else. God, those are just excuses. God, I pray for a heart of our church to be, here I am, send me. Especially this weekend, God, as we're looking 
face long into our fall festival. God, there's so many excuses we could use this weekend. I got this going on. I got that going on. There's not enough time. God, that to know that you are showing up and working and we can walk into your presence this weekend. God, we need to be able to be armed with prayer and be dangerous for you. So God, this morning, examine our hearts. Search us, God. And show us our hearts. Test us and show us anything that we're afraid of, even in this moment of praying this prayer. See if there's any any sinful ways, God, any offensive ways in us. And lead us in the way everlasting, not just, not just to be alive and just to be saved and to exist, God, but to live in a life of abundance in you, knowing that it's you bringing everything to the table. We bring nothing but surrender. As we continue praying this morning and our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. My challenge all through these three weeks has been for you to pray these prayers. And, and I, the truth is, you don't have to pray these prayers, and we don't want you to feel like or manipulate you into praying these prayers. What we want to do is challenge you when you're ready to pray these prayers to know that they are there. And so this morning, the challenge is still there for this prayer for God to send me. So this morning, but I don't want you to feel like you have to pray this prayer. I don't want you to feel manipulated. We want, want you to be able to be free in God's grace. So the challenge this morning, and it may be for this next week, it may be for the rest of your life, I don't know, but the challenge this morning is for you to be able to adopt this prayer into your prayer life and say, not only God search me, not only God break me, but God send me. I will sign that blank contract. Whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, I'll go. So this morning, I know it takes strength, and it's, not, it's a dangerous prayer, it's not an easy prayer, and some of us aren't ready to pray that prayer yet, and that's okay. But some of us in this room are ready to pray that prayer, and we've been holding back, and today is our time. So in this moment right now, if this is the prayer you want in your life, if you're tired of saying, okay, I, here I am, God, I won't go, or here I am, God, send someone else. If you're ready to say, here I am, God, send me. I want to pray for you. Nobody's looking around, and I don't want you to feel guilty. I just want you to be honest where you're at. If that's where you want to be, if that's the prayer you want to be challenged to pray, if you're ready to make that part of your life this week, will you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Right where you sit. Thank you. Keep them up. Keep them up. Thank you. Thank you. God, I lift up these hands to you right now. These represent hearts. Each of these hands are attached to a heart. God, that wants to be conformed to your image. God, this is dangerous. There's things in our life that need to be searched. There's things in our lives that need to be broken. But ultimately, God, as we stand in your presence, we see those things. And we want to fall into your grace. And in obedience to know, God, here I am, send me. So I pray now for strength in these lives, for clarity in these lives, for direction and wisdom in these lives, God. And God, even if one of us, even if one of us is able to grasp onto this, this could shake the foundations of our community. God, use our church. Bring us to a place where as a church, we are here and we're ready to be sent. God, here we are, sent South Peoria. God, I pray for this weekend with this fall festival that we live this out, God. We will speak boldly. We will love like we haven't loved before. We will give freely. We will show people your face because they see us. So God, we pray for your, for your presence to be in complete control, for your grace to be in complete control, for your gospel to be a light this weekend. As we continue praying this morning, you may be here this morning, you may be with us this morning, and you, you, you've learned about God, or you kind of know about God, or you're just trying out the church thing, or trying to figure out who God is, and the truth is, you've never come to a point of really understanding who Jesus is, or that you can even have a relationship with Jesus, and here's the simple truth, this is so beautiful, the gospel, the reason we do this, the whole purpose for this is called the gospel, and this is what it is, that God loved us so much that he sent Jesus, his only son, to die for you and me because when we stand in God's presence, our sin does not deserve his glory. But his grace is shown on the cross that when Jesus died, he paid the price for you and for me. His blood covered your sins. And just like that coal touched the lips of Isaiah, his blood covers and forgives everything we have done so that we can stand in the grace of God so this morning, if you're here this morning, you've never had that moment in your life, you've never had an opportunity to say, you know what, this is my time, I want to know Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, it says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. 
So today, don't let today go by without knowing that the Savior of the world is there for you. Don't let this day go by without having a relationship with him. So if that's this prayer this morning, if you want to say, God, I know I need you. Jesus, I know you died to forgive me of my sins, and I want to give you my life. This morning, if you're here this morning, and that wants, you want that to be your prayer this morning, nobody's looking around. It's just you, and it's just me. I want to pray for you. So if that's you this morning, raise your hand so I can see you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. God, we come to you right now. Your word tells us that heaven rejoices when people confess with their mouth and believe in their hearts that you are Lord because salvation has come. Your spirit dwells in us when we do that, God. So in this moment right now, as we bow before you, these hands have been raised. If you raised your hand, I just want to lead you in a prayer. And it's something simple, and you can say it in your own words, but it goes something like this. God, I know I need you. I know I'm a sinner. And I know your grace and your love is real. So please take my life, forgive me of my sins, and help me to live for you. If that's your prayer this morning, I want to tell you what that means. That means that you are experiencing what it is to become a new creation in Jesus that you're becoming spiritually alive, that the flesh is old and the spirit is new, and that you have become to life in Christ, a personal relationship with Jesus, something that is so precious, and the heavens are rejoicing right now. And so I want to celebrate that with you. That is an exciting thing. Don't let today go by without sharing what God has just done in your heart. Don't let today go by without telling somebody what God has done in your life. Don't let today go by without letting us know, hey, this is what God has done in my heart so we can celebrate with you. In just a few moments, we're going to sing a song of response. This is when our church responds to what God's doing in our hearts. And we're going to have some church leaders up here who are here to pray with you. We are going to have some church leaders up here. If you just want to come up and just kneel at the altar and just pray for God, Pray to God and pray for God to give you the strength to be able to pray these prayers. I'm going to encourage you to be bold in this moment of response. Let the Spirit continue to work in your hearts. If you just prayed that prayer with us, I encourage you to come down and speak to one of our church leaders and say, hey, I just started a relationship with Jesus. What's next? If you pray, raised your hand and you asked for strength that you want to be able to pray that prayer for sin, I encourage you, let God work in your life. If you want to come down and ask somebody to pray for you, be bold. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you and we know that you are at work in this room and you are good. So God, we give this moment to you. We ask that you use this, your continued work in our hearts. God, that we act with boldness this morning. That we say, God, here I am, send me. In your name we pray, amen. Stand with us as we sing, you be bold and come forward.